So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Salerno, uh, professor of biology uh, here at FDU uh, Madison. I'm also the sus environmental sustainability coordinator here on campus. Uh, we're pleased to have Ambassador Kamal again to moderate an interesting discussion with our guest speaker, Mr. James Sniffen, senior officer from the UN Environmental Program uh, on the topic reversing climate change. Too little, uh, too late. Uh, I'm an aquatic toxicologist. Uh, as my background, I'm well aware of the consequences of chemical inoculation into the environment. Uh, and we've been continuing to alter ecosystems based on the amount of chemicals that we're introducing in the atmosphere. And it is a fact that we are changing the biology uh, in many ecosystems across the globe. Um, climate change really has become the forefront in terms of biology uh, across the world, uh, especially with the 2013 I. PCC draft that came out about two weeks ago uh, as a product of several hundred professors, uh, scientists from 39 countries. So as such, I think this is really an opportune time to break into this discussion. Uh, in terms of academic institutions joining us today, I'd like to welcome Adelphi University, uh, Bronx Community College, Lehigh, uh, LIU Brooklyn campus, LIU Post campus, Mercy College, Skidmore College, FDU Vancouver, FDU Metro, and FDU College of Florham. And I'd like to extend a special uh, welcome to Adelphi, LIU, and Skidmore for joining us for the first time. Uh, so in terms of questions, we'll go ahead in that order. And uh, Ambassador Kamal, I'd like to turn the session over to you. Thank you very much. I join you in welcoming uh, the four new universities. Uh, and this is truly the first time that we have dealt with 10 universities together uh, on, in this video conference program. So it is a first for us also. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Sniffen, who is uh, the ranking officer in charge of the environment in the United Nations, a person for whom we have much affection and respect. Uh, and for whose views I have total disregard. Uh, we have been at opposite ends of the table now for years. And I want to explain why before I give him the floor. Uh, the concept of the environment suddenly turned up on the scene around 1971. Before that, nobody even knew what, how to spell the word environment in the United Nations. In 71, a group of young economists got together in a motel in Switzerland and wrote a report called the Fune Report, in which they said, ladies and gentlemen, the environment is important and you should be thinking about it. And that then led to a conference, a global conference in Stockholm in 1972, and the establishment of the UN Environment Program in Nairobi in 74. But most of us did not agree with this whole concept. And we did not agree because for us, the fundamental problem in the world was development and poverty. In other words, the people were in abject poverty around the world, in the billions. And so while the environment was important, as is uh, the concept of different flavors of ice cream, you have to establish priorities and in priorities there is no comparison between the environment and environmental concerns and development and poverty concerns and 30 million people are dying every year because of abject poverty and so the debate was really about development in the United Nations and that debate was intense and uh, and very, very deep. And then around 1986, the uh, group of Western countries, which, you know, have a sort of a uh, 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 hormone, uh, hormonal attraction towards the environment, decided that the only way to silence the developmental countries, that is the poor in the world, which is three quarters of the world, was to try to marry the environment with development and to say that there is a link between the two. And that link is what was created in 1986 
called the sustainable development concept. Now, we objected to that even then because we said development does not need an adjective. Development is development and there is an absence of development in the world. And so we do not want any adjectives to pull down the importance of development. But that debate continued until a major event which took place in 1990. And that event was the disappearance of the Soviet Union. Until 1990, the United Nations was bipolar. In other words, they were, we were on a hammock strung between two trees, one tree called the United States and the other tree called the Soviet Union. And then one of these trees collapsed. And as a result, that hammock on which the debate was taking place came to an end. And suddenly then, environment and human rights took off to take the pressure off on the developmental debate. And the result is that today everybody is talking about the environment. Everybody is talking about human rights and nobody is talking about development because it has been pushed onto the back burner, even though it is by far the most important problem in the world. There is no comparison between developmental concerns and environmental or human rights concerns. And so we have a problem and we have not managed to resolve this problem because everybody is so caught up. The concept of the environment is so sexy and development is totally non-sexy. And so nobody wants to talk about the development or poverty alleviation and everybody wants to talk about the environment. And so here we are. Uh, uh, with uh, with Mr. Sniffen, who is, as I said, uh, the passionate uh, proponent of uh, sex, which is uh, environment, uh, and he does not let me survive, uh, and because he says, talk about environment, talk about human rights, don't talk about development. And, and I keep telling him that, you know, there are people, there's this photograph in 1994, which won the Pulitzer Prize, in which there was a little girl, six-month-old girl in Sudan, sitting on the floor, dirty, filthy, starved, distended stomach, bone sticking out, flies all over her. And quite clearly, from that photograph, it is clear that this girl is about to die of starvation. And next to her, if you don't believe that she is about to die, you had proof in that photograph. And because next to her is standing a vulture, I repeat, a vulture, waiting for that girl to die so that the vulture can start eating up the girl. That is the world in which we live. And the tragedy of the world is not the girl. It is not the vulture. It is the photographer. Because the photographer is you each one of you at these universities, because that poverty, that hunger, that disease is happening in front of you. And so, and you don't notice it because you are interested in environment and human rights. And so I hold, I personally hold each one of you responsible for the situation in the world. But above all, I hold Mr. Stephen responsible for the situation in the world. The floor is yours. Defend yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Ambassador. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, particularly fairly Dickinson, because I live just down the street from you, uh, the one in Teaneck. Uh, I'm in Ridgefield Park. Um, anyway, as Ambassador said, there is this tension, or has been this tension for well over 20, 30 years within the international community about how to deal with the two issues uh, of environment and development. Do we deal with them together in the, under the concept of sustainable development? Or do we do, deal with them separately uh, in different camps, so to speak? Um, over the years, particularly since the early 90s, the UN uh, has tried to address them together under a series of conferences and summits dealing with sustainable development. First in Rio de Janeiro in 92, several since then, most recently again in Rio in 2012. The conferences have led to a 
series of international treaties and plans of action over time uh, to deal with what's known as sustainable development or aspects of it, such as <clears throat> climate change, which uh, where the first international treaty to deal with it, it came out of the Rio conference in 1992. Others uh, dealing with biological diversity, desertification, uh, forestry issues, this one, or fisheries, uh, also either came from Rio or started right after Rio. Um, my organization predates it uh, by 20 years. Uh, we were founded, as Ambassador said, in the 70s. Uh, we're based in Nairobi, Kenya, not here in New York. Uh, we have a small office here, which I work out of after having served in Nairobi for about six or seven years in the 1990s. Uh, our role has definitely changed over time. Certainly in the beginning, we championed the traditional green issues of air, land, water. Um, but being based in Kenya sort of gave us a, a different perspective on a lot of issues that other parts of the UN system may not have had. Since Kenya is, uh, from, for the most part, a very, very poor country. Uh, with great uh, inequalities, uh, very little middle class and, and great extremes of wealth. It, but it's, it is an economy that's heavily dependent on its natural resources, uh, both for tourism, both for exports. Um, so UNEP itself, the environment program, early on before the term um, sustainable development was coined in the 80s, late 80s, used the term environment for development with the idea being that a healthy environment underpins uh, any kind of development uh, strategies, whether it be agriculture based or, or else uh, other uh, natural resource based economies, uh, even tourism uh, as well. In the run up, well, over, year, over time that led to the uh, emergence of a whole host of international treaties even before the Earth Summit in 92, dealing with different aspects of environmental change, such as the ozone hole uh, over Antarctica uh, in the mid 80s to the treaties dealing with migratory species or endangered species, such as the uh, ivory and rhino horn uh, in the late 70s. Uh, over time, particularly after 1992, there was an explosion of international treaties dealing with various issues of the environment or sustainable development. Some international, more regional and sub-regional to the point where you had almost 500 treaties that, that had an international dimension to them that dealt with the environment. In the, in the going, getting back to the topic of today, which is climate change, in the late 80s, um, it was a very small country, actually, that brought it to the attention of the, uh, of the General Assembly here in New York, and that was Malta. Malta felt that the UN should deal with what's known as the global commons, and that is, or the common heritage of mankind is another way of looking at it, and that is the oceans of the planet, the atmosphere, Antarctica, things that are not governed by one country or a group of countries, including, including under UN uh, auspices. Uh, that led to a General Assembly resolution which asked the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization, which is the UN's climate agency based in Geneva, to look at what science is telling about climate change, all aspects of it. Because in the late 80s, governments were being bombarded with literature, both of a scientific nature, but also of a public nature, uh, on different aspects related to climate. And they really wanted to know, get a clearer picture of what is the scientific consensus about the issue. And that led to the creation of a scientific panel called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which, depending on which issue they're dealing with, roughly has 
2,000 scientists which contribute to the process in some fashion, either by authors or by being reviewers of, of the literature. Um, the IPCC works in, under three working groups. One deals with science, one deals with the impacts, and one deals with solutions or how to address the emissions. Um, they issued their first report in 1990. And each of the working group reports is about the size of the Manhattan phone book, about 1,500 pages. Then, meeting with governments, they come up with a summary of each of the working group's report, and that's about 50 or 60 pages or more in some cases. And those documents are agreed to by governments and the scientists word for word so that when governments go back home and want to develop either national policy or contribute to international policy, they have something, the basis of what they would uh, agree to, all could agree to. And the scientists make sure that whatever the politicians agree to, the policymakers agree to, it, it can be backed up what's in the, in the major study behind it. And then they come up eventually with an overall summary, which is what uh, forms the basis of international policy making. It's called the synthesis report. They've been issuing reports roughly every five years since 1990. The first one led two years later to the UN Treaty on Climate Change in 1992, which basically says we have this uncontrolled chemistry experiment going on in the atmosphere. We think it's uh, caused by the emissions of fossil fuel-based energy sources and deforestation. And the international community needs to work together to try to come up with a solution. Five years later, they issued another report which began to point the finger more de definitively at all of us as the culprit in the change that's occurring in the atmosphere and the impacts that we're starting to see. And that led to a treaty in 1997 which put teeth into the original treaty. It's called the Kyoto Protocol. And Kyoto gave emission reduction targets to 38 industrialized countries. Kyoto is very unique in international law in that as most international treaties have a clause that says something like 90 days after 30 countries have ratified it, it becomes international law. What Kyoto says, 90 days after 55 industrial, 55 countries have ratified it, which must represent 55% of industrial, industrial country emissions. Well, from your history books, you may know that under the second Bush administration, Bush Jr., um, the United States announced that they had no intent of ratifying Kyoto because they didn't believe in the science, they didn't uh, understand or didn't agree with the fact that only industrialized countries had emission targets and it would have a, <clears throat> have a devastating economic impact uh, on the US economy as the largest economy in the world. Well, over time they began to ac accept the science, certainly recognizing the fact or, or realizing the fact that a good two thirds of the IPCC scientists are US government scientists either from NASA, NOAA, to a lesser extent from EPA, uh, and from universities, as uh, even some of yours most likely have contributed over, over the last 25 years or so to the process. But over time, the IPCC reports became much stronger and more definitive in what they were telling the international community. And, the, and a shift began in, in, the, in this century with the 2001 report and definitely with the 2007 report that instead of looking primarily at how to, how to control the emissions, it uh, began to focus a lot more on the impact side of it. Beginning to realize or try to educate people about the fact that the areas of the planet that are most likely to be affected by climate change or are being affected are those that have least responsibility for causing it, meaning sub-Saharan Africa, delta regions of every continent, uh, small island states, specific, uh, particularly in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, to a lesser extent in the Caribbean. The IPCC has begun the next series of reports just two weeks ago. The science report has come out 
um, and it is much more definitive on the range of temperature uh, rise that could be expected by 2100, what could be expected in, in your lifetime in 2030, 2050. Uh, the, the, it's much more definitive on the potential impacts or the, the potential extent of sea level rise uh, because there's a lot more literature and a lot more scientific research that has been undertaken in the last five or six years about Greenland. It's much more definitive on the impacts in the Arctic with the sea level, sea ice cap being uh, melting at a faster rate, particularly in summertime. And it begins to talk a bit more about the impact of extreme weather events. Whether we will see more Hurricane Sandys or we'll see more intensive storms. Uh, I interrupt because one of the universities is not muted and I can hear conversation and it's looping back and interfering with the sound of, uh, of uh, Mr. Sniffen. Could all the universities stay muted until uh, the microphone is given to them one by one? Back to you, sir. Well, just to wrap up uh, and to allow time for uh, Q&A, a generalization about the impacts of climate change would be that across the world would be that wet areas, i.e. tropical areas, will likely be wetter than they are now. Drier areas would be drier than they are now, so droughts would be more extensive, longer duration. Um, sea coasts or coastlines uh, will be impacted more directly than they have been by, and not just by storms, but on a more recurrent basis. Uh, Things like monsoons will, will last longer uh, over time. But by the same token, there is a gradual shift towards greener technologies in the planet, whether it's energy, whether it's transportation, whether it's construction, that are being taken up by countries all over the world, with probably China being the best example of a lot of them. Uh, so that there is a shift in, in policy to react to it. Whether it is enough, whether it's fast enough, still remains to be seen. So I'll leave it there and we can go off in whatever direction you want to take with the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I open the floor to questions, and I'll be going down to each university in alphabetical order, and each university will give us two questions, which we will take together and answer together. But before I go to Adelphi, <coughs> I'd like to ask you two questions myself, sir. Sure. Surely, with your love of endangered species and your love of, uh, of uh, uh, climate change, uh, you realize that the real endangered species in the world is not, uh, is not uh, elephants or rhinoceros or redwood trees, but human beings that they are the endangered species in the world. 30 million are dying every year. And you don't worry about that at all because you're so worried about the smoke coming out of smokestacks. And I think there is something crazy about your thinking process. And number two, the problem is not a problem of climate change, but a problem of wasting consumption. Your entire living style is based on overconsumption and therefore on wastage because you want to buy one pencil you go into staples and staples gives you a choice of 50 pencils of 49 are of no use to you that is wastage and so the concept of overconsumption and wastage which is a pure western invention this is your headache the rest of the world does not waste we are under consuming and seriously under consuming and so the fact that you are wasting resources and that your footprint is so large that you are uh, taking resources from the rest of the world, I think that is the problem. And why are you so worried suddenly about the fact of global warming? Global warming means that I'll die in 50 years. I don't care. I am more worried about not dying tomorrow. 
out of starvation and look at me look at yourself you are nice and obese i, I have bones sticking out so i am the person who suffers because of your concentration on global warming and over consumption so defend yourself sir well i think uh, well first of all i get uh, challenged on all these topics because i happen to be an american but uh but in reality he's criticizing all of you <laughs> as being american uh, consumers but um uh, in any case um i think well as you know one of the most famous speeches that occurred in the conference that created my organization was given by prime minister gandhi um in 1972 um where she said that the most environmentally destructive process in the on the planet was poverty and and we totally agree uh, and the UN totally agrees and that's why they embarked upon the millennium development goals in 1992 no 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 please uh, you are not going to let you escape that state you said the UN believes in that that is not true if you believe in it put the money where your mouth is and there's no money there is no money for development we agreed on 0.7% of the uh, of the riches yes. of the world and it never came that's not the un's fault that, but then why don't say that the un is uh, you had agreed to that target didn't it yeah but the, i am not interested in the target <laughs> i'm interested in the money on the table well some and countries have met the target only five Yeah, they're all Nordics, <laughs> and certainly not the United States. Oh, they never agreed to it. <laughs> That's for sure. Back to you. Anyway, until uh, as I said, until I was interrupted. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, I agree that the poverty eradication is the primary goal of the of the United Nations, and that's what the targets that were established under the Millennium Development Goals, which includes mainstreaming environmental sustainability as goal seven. uh as a contribution to that whether it's to deal with poverty eradication itself meaning a dollar figure per capita or hunger or water supply or sanitation access uh or health indicators they're all intertwined and that's the notion behind the millennium development goals and would be will be behind whatever emerges in the next iteration of them in 2015 um one of the things i think the climate uh reports do focus on are the human impact of climate change if unchecked meaning if we continue business as usual what will it mean beyond warmer temperatures melting glaciers the the ecosystem impacts what will it mean to humans well as i mentioned the the places on the planet which will be most affected are those least responsible but also those with few options to address these problems and that's the whole notion of adapting to climate change how can they adapt uh by themselves if if they can adapt by themselves do they need help whether it's is it just technology that's needed or whether it's financing or whether it's human resources capacity building and that's the, where the discussion is right now how do we do this how do the developed countries the donor countries how do how do the emerging economies the china's indias and brazils of the world contribute in some fashion beyond their own domestic efforts so what one area where climate change will have a very dramatic effect or exacerbate uh conditions will be on the health side it will as ambassador kamal mentioned there are millions of people dying out of, just by poverty Well a great deal of them are dying because of water issues whether it's the quality of water or access to to water supplies in general and that that will be exacerbated by changes in ecosystems where people don't have access to convenient water supply or because water supplies are becoming more salinic with the encroachment of seawater particularly in coastal areas particularly on small island states which have very precarious water supply to begin with so dealing addressing these issues is what the international community has to deal with in the near term if if many parts of the planet are going to be continue to be uh places where people want to live and can live uh so a great deal of effort is going in that direction whether it's to address the health impacts 
both on a national level or a regional level, but also on the individual household level by changes in uh, cooking stoves, by trying to address indoor air pollution, which contributes to what's known as black carbon and methane emissions, things that affect you and I if you're exposed to them on a regular basis in very close quarters. So there is a very human impact that everyone realizes both in the short term and in the longer term, particularly with regard to changes in ecosystems and how it might impact water supply and food security as well. Uh, let's take questions. As I said, we will take two questions from each university in the first round, starting with Adelphi, and after that, Bronx, if they are online, if they are not online, then Lehigh. So, Adelphi, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, sir. I'd like to ask, what is the hard scientific evidence to support that climate change is caused by humans rather than just another natural warming period uh, every several thousand years? Okay, second question. Uh, that's our only question. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Well, there are natural cycles uh, that the, the planet goes through. What has changed, in the, particularly since the end of the Second World War, is the rate of change that is occurring. Things are happening at an astoundingly fast rate that can only be explained by the uh, exponential growth of carbon in the atmosphere, the concentration of carbon. In 1850, carbon parts per million in the atmosphere was roughly 280 parts per million. Right now, we're right at 400 parts per million, and that can only be explained by the emissions of fossil fuel, which comes from human activities for the most part, industrial processes, electricity generation, factories, transportation, and to a lesser extent, deforestation. It's the only uh, plausible answer for what's happening since 1950. Um, the extent of it or the rate of it uh, is certainly subject to scientific query, but the overwhelming scientific belief, i.e. 97% of scientific re uh, literature that comes out on, on the question points to the fingerprint of all of us as the culprit. So the, the science is overwhelming. What you do about it and whether you feel it's important to do something about it is a totally different discussion. Yeah, but the question is totally legitimate because the world has been through major cycles. All this area, Adelphi, Bronx, Lehigh, uh, Long Island, all this was under one mile of ice sure. in the past. And so that, and so we've had cold weather and we've had hot weather in the world. And so there's a lot of external factors which Sorry. are responsible for that. All that you have said is that there is a graph of carbon dioxide emissions of fossil uh, greenhouse emissions and a graph of of uh, of, of uh, temperature, temperature. and the two graphs uh, seem to run in parallel. I can very easily make a graph of the consumption of ice cream over the past hundred years and show that it is increasing at the same rate. And that, in other words, that it is the consumption of ice cream which is leading to climate change. And so it doesn't prove the point. I can agree that perhaps human beings are overconsuming, and I'm sure that you are overconsuming. And in which case, the correct answer is what is what you yourself have developed, which is the precautionary principle, which is when in doubt, don't. If you have any doubt, and I have doubts, like the gentleman from Adelphi, if they, you are in doubt, then stop over-consuming. But you are not willing to cut down over-consumption. You don't sign the Kyoto Protocol. Major countries have not signed the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol. And so, the major consumption, you, you, you're pointing one finger. <laughs> that one finger which has not signed the Kyoto Protocol is 25% of the total emissions in the world. And so, cut down overconsumption is my answer. Not, not this concentration on, you know, putting pressure on the rest of the world to give up development 
and to go for what you call sustainable development, which I don't believe in. Yeah. Well, the other aspect with just to add to the temperature change is the impact on the it. The temperature it's, change between you and me? Or? <laughs> yes, it's getting hotter. It's getting hotter in the room. Uh, the, uh, no, temp what, what are the impacts of temperature rise? And that, and, that, and that is manifested in real time, and that's the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the changes in ecosystems, the changes in weather patterns, the changes in rainfall patterns. And that is directly tied to temperature rise, which is directly, the only plausible answer is the carbon concentration in the atmosphere, which is reflecting back more heat. It gets, it gets offset by uh, periodic volcano eruptions like Pinatubo in the 90s uh, and, and lesser things. There, there are areas of it which they don't fully, still don't fully understand, and that is how much do the oceans absorb. Okay. <clears throat> Paul, did you say Bronx is online? Yes. Bronx, you have two questions from Bronx, followed by two questions from Lehigh. Over to Bronx. Good afternoon, my name is O'Brien Wua. I'm a pre-nursing student. Uh, my question is, what is the United Nations that attempts in solving or addressing Africa's deforestation problems? As this also contributes to global warming. Thank you. Second question. Good morning. Uh, my name is Claudio Mazzucenta. I'm a professor in the biology department. Uh, my question is this. Uh, on September the 27th, uh, the, the report of the inter, inter, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that uh, climate change, and I quote in uh, Thomas Tucker, co-chair, uh, threatens our planet, our only hope. And they claim that 95% uh, certain is that human are the dominant cause. Two days later, on se September 30, on the Financial Post, which is a newspaper, Canadian newspaper, Professor Judith Curry, she is a professor and chair of the School of Earth and Atmosphere at uh, Georgia University, said uh, uh, kill the IPCC after the case and Understand the climate body still failed to put the humans behind warming. And she said, after several decades and expenditure in the bazillions, the IPCC still has to secure a convincing argument for how much more the criticized by humans. So, my question is how reliable is the information in the model climate change pattern? And how, if it's distorted enough, is the attack to the statement that dominant cause of climate change is not project? Thank you very much. These are very good questions. Uh, Mr. Sniffen, we are being carried away by you and 2,500 scientists in the IPCC. It's not a very large number of people, 2,500 compared to. The rest of the world, sir. And we have no idea of what sources they are using other than these simple two graphs. One, the graph of uh, greenhouse emissions and the other graph is of uh, temperature changes. And on the, that simple single graph, we are building up a whole tier which is denying funds for development in the world because funds are being diverted into environmental uh, efforts and so uh, something something why are you so carried away by 2500 scientists so-called scientists uh, uh, when as i said i can prove with the same amount of accuracy that the consumption of ice cream has led to the uh, change in temperature of the world and not deforestation. That's a very good question again. Because who is doing the deforestation? The deforestation is being done by these Western corporations who go into who go into Africa and corporations, are, yes. Of course. Not Western. And, and are who and are sucking the blood of Africa in order to get to the raw materials which are essential. This is it's criminal what is happening I agree. in in Africa. Not uh, just there. Just to take the example of 
uh, these uh, cell phones, these, uh, which all of us are using, all cell phones, all cell phones in the world need a mineral called coltan, which comes from the Congo or from Sierra Leone. And where the binding conditions are horrible. Young children, 10 years, 12 years old, are in abject poverty, are being forced to mine for this mineral so that you can have your cell phone in your pocket and receive calls from your girlfriends. So, and I, you. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, please have a proper sense of power. That's right. my advice to you. Back to you. Um, so let me address the IPCC issue. The, the role of the IPCC is not to conduct new research. The role of the IPCC is to look at scientific literature and come to a consensus among themselves on what it is saying. In the end, because they have to agree on what the science is saying amongst themselves, they actually are taking the least common denominator in their reports. Meaning this is the, what they issue in the reports are what they all can agree on as the likely uh, findings from the scientific community. As I said, there have been reviews of scientific literature that point to the fact that well over 95% of scientific literature deals, says climate change is real and that there is a human footprint on it. Uh, there are people that don't agree, certainly in the scientific community, but they are in a very small minority. They are very vocal, but they are still a very small minority on, in a global scale. Scientists are not there because they have all this free time on their hand. They are nominated by their governments. They come from government institutions. They change over time. The younger generation of scientists comes on board. They're much more global in, in their diversity than they were in the, in the early 90s, where they were overwhelmingly American. So it, it is the scientific community that's telling us we have this issue, and it's up to the policymakers to come up with responses to it. As to the, the financing of it, the IPCC is a very cheap process because everything is done through donations of governments and time and expertise. The only costs are the printing of the publications primarily and the secretariat which convenes the meetings and that's eight people that deal with this process. So there's very little money in the IPCC itself. Money definitely goes to research on, on atmospheric conditions and climate and, climate and impacts and, and so forth and solutions for that matter, not from the, the scientific community, but from the technical community. To address the, the African deforestation issue, it's, it, there is a deforestation issue globally. It's not just Africa, but Africa happens to be the, the area where the rates are the highest at the moment, particularly Central Africa. And it's, it's a very complex situation because it's, uh, there is so much conflict in the region, whether it's in the Congo, whether it's in Central African Republic uh, and, and other areas of Central Africa and to a lesser extent in, in West Africa. So it's complicated. It's, it's, as Ambassador uh, Kamal mentioned, it's also complicated because it's, there are issues beyond uh, forests that are involved in the, in the uh, economies or the illicit economies, black, eco black market in the region and uh, rare earth minerals are one, coltan being the primary one in certain parts of Central Africa. And, and what happens with me, most of these uh, natural resources which are sold uh, either directly through uh, government sources or indirectly th uh, via uh, guerrilla forces, syndicates, uh, organized crime, is that they go to fund the conflicts themselves with uh, the buying of weapons. Um, and it's even extended uh, in recent times to uh, uh, an explosion of poaching in, in Africa, in Central Africa, because of the ivory trade and rhino trade, rhino horn trade. So the UN works with the governments and with uh, interested donor uh, governments about working with governments, whether it's in Central Africa or whether it's in Southeast Asia and whether it's in uh, South America or Central America about addressing deforestation, whether it's by in 
working with them to develop financial incentives so that people don't cut down the trees to begin with and get credit for conserving the resource. Uh, and that's something called uh, RED, which is to reduce uh, emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and get so that they get they generate funds uh, by keeping their forest intact. And that there's a group of about 30 countries which have embarked upon that pilot uh, scheme at the moment, and it's heavily funded by the Norwegians. Um, there are others like that are, that are not exactly under the UN's uh, auspices, but maybe under the auspices of the World Bank, which um, to conserve forests uh, and get credit for it. Uh, so the, the governments are, have a better idea of, of exactly the value of, uh, of an intact ecosystem as opposed to the value of, the, of a production process which generates timber and paper. So the, the governments are beginning to realize that they don't need to cut down the forest uh, or give a blank check to a multinational to come in and decimate the forest and, and to, to generate revenue. They can do it in a, in a more phased approach, a much more uh, conservative approach to conserve their forest and still get credit for it, or realize that there are advantages by conserving it in the tourism sector or ecotourism sector so that people will visit these areas because of, of the, they are usually uh, the, the place where you'll find a wide diversity of, of plant and animal life that will be found nowhere else in the world. Uh, over to Lee Hai, two questions followed by Long Island University at Brooklyn. Lee Hai, you have the floor. Hi, I'm Bridget Gilmore. I go to Saucon Valley High School and I'm visiting Lehigh University for this conference. Thank you for speaking today. Um, Mr. Sniffen, I think you addressed this a little bit in your last answer, but do you think that there's a way to balance the immediate needs of development through reactionary policies and the longer range concerns of environment through anticipatory policies? And also, what are your thoughts about economic urgencies and reservations for the UN addressing climate change? Second, second question. Hi, I'm Natalie Levan. I'm with Lehigh University. I'm a graduate student here. And um, this question, we really appreciate you both being here, by the way. Um, this question is directed to Mr. Kamal. Um, how do you suggest we encourage development without creating another wasteful, overdeveloped country? Thank you. Take Thank the you. Question. Well, what we, uh, as an organization, uh, the UN's Environment Program has <clears throat> been doing probably for the last 20 years or so, has been working with other parts of the UN system, particularly the development side of things, the UN Development Program primarily, but others, uh, at the national level, um, where we don't, we hadn't normally worked, uh, we tend to work at a global or regional level, but working with them not with the environment ministry directly, but by working with the planning ministry or the finance ministry to try to get environment considerations mainstreamed into development policy making at the national level. So that the things don't have to be added on or parachute in uh, after um, the government has embarked on a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, or so, so forth. So that they take into account the value of their natural resources, the conservation of the resources, and not just the uh, exploitation of them. And given that we are in Africa, our base there, our primary focus has been on Sub-Saharan Africa, but not exclusively. Uh, certainly, Central America is another area where we work quite a bit with the UN Development Program on that. So our efforts, along with other parts of the UN system, has been to try to work with governments in striking that balance. The governments themselves have to set the priorities, though. So they may say, yes, we agree, we need to put environment into it, but into our uh, development planning, but we would think we should focus on the fishery sector or the forestry sector more so than, say, uh, other parts of the economy, the extractive industry sector, because we're, we're so dependent on that for job creation and whatnot. We need to do, deal with this, at least in the beginning, in other <coughs> sectors. Um, so it's instead of uh, trying to 
work with the ministries of environment directly in most countries, particularly in the developing world, we realize that the powers that be are actually in those parts of the government or parts of the cabinet which control the, the resources, which control the budgets, and so forth. So we're trying to do both at the same time, trying to build up the capacity of environment ministries around the world, uh, while at the same time trying to educate and made, make other parts of national governments aware of, of the need to take into account the environment from the beginning. And we're being fairly successful at it, but it will take a lot of time. And, it, and in some countries, of course, it gets changes occur because of either natural disasters or human disasters. I didn't fully capture the second part of the question. No. Not the not the one to you, but there was a there was a one about um, economic change, I guess. Uh, if you could repeat it. The second part of the first second question. part of the first question. Um, what are how do you feel about like economic urgencies and reservations for about the UN addressing climate change? Like, do you think that there are like what do you what side do you pick that there's more urgencies or reservations, and how do you feel about that? Can I add a supplementary to that? The UNEP, which is your organization, has a budget of ten million dollars or so annually. annually. That chicken feed. Yeah. I mean, so you talk so much about the environment with such a loud mouth, but there's no money even behind you. So 140 million dollars is not going to change the environment of the world. True. And so uh, the, the whole thing is more talk well, than reality. What on that part? What has changed in the last 20 years is there's so many other parts of the international community dealing with environment. So the pie is, is cut up differently now. The pie is bigger, certainly bigger, but it's just more is going to the World Bank in particular. It has an enormous environment portfolio, <clears throat> as does the UN Development Program, as does UNICEF. I mean, UNICEF is the leading agency on water and sanitation in the, in the uh, UN community. So there is, and then there's the t proliferation of treaties themselves. Um, so there is there is a lot more money out there for environmental issues at the international level, not so much coming our way uh, as an organization, but that's changing too. The uh, second, let the me second. take the second question on uh, uh, the of global <clears throat> development. It's a legitimate question. Please note three things. Firstly, all development, all development is environmentally unfriendly. Because development requires the cutting of trees to build roads, the building of factories, and factories are going to throw out smoke in order to get jobs. So urbanization is going to create environmental problems. And so all development is basically environmentally unfriendly. But that being said, the chances of overdevelopment are just not, do not exist. At the moment, 2.5, 2.5 billion human beings, that's one third of the population of the world, are living on less than $2 a day. 1.8 billion are living on less than $1.25 a day. That's abject poverty. And so the, the problem is that money is just not forthcoming. This is a problem which requires a major, a macro effort not a minor effort, and the macro effort is not there. There is more money being spent on dogs and cows than on human beings in the world. In France, every cow gets a subsidy of $2 a day for being a cow. That is better than two and a half billion human beings. In the United States, you have dogs uh, which are being fed on dog food with caviar and smoked salmon, you have dog taxis, you have dog doctors, you have dog psychologists, you have dog psychiatrists. I saw a dog taxi today in New York, only for dogs. There is a television channel for dog lovers, and they are about to open a ch television channel for dogs, so that dogs can sit in front of TV and watch other dogs. And I have a heart. There's something crazy about all of you. Uh, if, if you don't see human beings, 
but you see dogs instead. And so uh, I, I have a major problem with Mr. Stephen, as you can see, because he is defending the dogs and the cows of the world today. And I am defending the human beings. And that is the dividing line between him and me at this table. Over to Lehigh for two questions from Lehigh, followed by two no, questions. That was Lehigh. I'm sorry, two questions from Long Island, Brooklyn, followed by two questions from Long Island Post. Long Island, Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Daniel Cooper. Hi, um, I'm a graduate student in political science and UN studies. Uh, my question is, how can countries develop if environmental factors, several of which have shown to be related directly to climate change, like examples like droughts and their effects on food supplies, um, floods and large storms, um, especially like in small island states, as was mentioned, how can that happen if those hamper progress? Yeah, natural disasters. Okay, second question. I am Mobilaji Ogunleye. I am also a graduate student of uh, Political Science UN Studies. And my question is, with regards to the disforestation of the Amazon, um, have countries like Brazil and Indonesia, who depend heavily on logging as an economic necessity, been offered alternatives? If so, what are they and where would funding come from? They're cutting trees because you want the wood. Yes. My house is brick. <laughs> um, seriously, uh, there is a direct link, certainly, between climate change and disaster risk, uh, whether it's uh, sea level rise or whether it's intensive storms. And as you say, uh, governments need to set priorities on how they're going to uh, use their expenditures. Do they? Do they use them to uh, focus exclusively on economic expansion, or do they use them in a in a moderated fashion where they grow, but in a uh, environmentally friendly way? And many countries have chosen to go down that path. Uh, some by uh, default because they have no other option, and that would be some of the small island states. Uh, they need to invest or have access to technology in the energy sector that is clean because they can't afford to import fossil fuels, uh, particularly in the Pacific, uh, where the sources are, are quite distant, uh, less so in the, in the Caribbean because there are oil supplies either in South America, Mexico, um, or even in Trinidad, for that matter, um, in, in, some, in one of the island states. Um, it, I think what the UN tries to do with those vulnerable parts of the planet, whether they be island states or, or elsewhere, is to raise awareness among the policymakers in those countries of possible alternatives, whether it be in the technology area uh, or whether it be in access to credit and finance. Because while there isn't a lot of money in the climate change sector, there is the beginnings of money coming in that the donor community has pledged, and in some cases, particularly with the Nordics, have offered to uh, give to countries that are fragile uh, or environmentally vulnerable, uh, those that are prone to disasters, uh, natural disasters, whether it be typhoons, hurricanes, and so forth. So they are sort of on the top of the list but we're not talking big money because most of these economies are small to begin with, or the population sizes are small. But there is an effort to, to focus on those that are most vulnerable, particularly the small island states. In fact, there will be a major, well, a, there will be an international conference next year that Samoa will host uh, uh, just on this topic in uh, late August of next year. Um, the other was about deforestation. Uh, particularly in the Amazon and, uh, and Southeast Asia or, or Indonesia. Um, in, in Brazil's case, Brazil's growth rate is quite strong and has been for quite a while. Um, and the rates of deforestation in, in the Amazon have slowed considerably in the last 10 years. It's still being cut down as it expands 
uh, agriculture, uh, but the rate of deforestation is much smaller than it used to be, but it's still a, a problem. And, and Brazil is a very, as most countries, is very nationalistic about being told what to do about the Amazon. Uh, it, it is very uh, environmentally friendly in, in many ways, and it doesn't want the international community, particularly those in the north, telling them what to do with the Amazon. But they are very cognizant domestically of the value of the Amazon to the to the planet, but also to their own economy. And taking and they're trying to take steps by diversifying their economy uh, and creating jobs in other parts of the, of the country, particularly in the south. Indonesia is. One of the few countries which has embarked upon what's known as a green economy, they realize they are heavily dependent on, on the plantations and the forests uh, on some of their islands. But they're also trying to rapidly diversify their economy and deal with the rapid urbanization in Jakarta and elsewhere by uh, creating jobs there in the service industry, in the high tech industry, which would allow them to be less dependent on their forest resources for exports uh, and for balance of payments. So they are beginning to shift. And some of this occurs when in countries when a, a president or a prime minister has, takes it upon themselves to sort of pull the country along uh, down a, a, a bit of a visionary path. And, and that's what has happened in the last few years in Indonesia in Costa Rica and a few other places where they have purposely, through legislation and regulatory frameworks, begun to shift the economy to in a greener path. Whether they be successful, you know, only you can tell 10, 15 years from now whether they've gone down that path. But they're trying their, their best to shift their economies. Uh, in support of Mr. Sniffer, uh, I would like to mention only two points. The first is that I read a report somewhere that in case of natural disasters, they have been multiplied three times in the past 20 years. The cost of those disasters has been multiplied eight times in the past 20 years. And the insurance cost of those disasters have been multiplied 15 times in the past 20 years. So there's no doubt that there is a certain cost to national disasters. The second point is about sea level rise. There are many islands because Mr. Stephen has referred to uh, you, in, the, in the Pacific, you take the name of Samoa. Samoa but, that was... but I would like to pick the name of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> the Maldives is a set of islands. It's a member state of the UN. And the average height of the Maldives is three feet. The whole nation is only three feet high. Now, Pakistan, which is where I come from, we have about 90 embassies in the world. And to each one of our embassy, the ambassadors, we give him a car uh, officially. But in the case of the Maldives, we have not given a car to the ambassador. We have given him a, a boat instead. So we are conscious of Mr. Sniffen and his efforts learn to swim uh, if we live in uh, island states. Uh, that being said, I'd like to shift to Long Island at uh, post, followed by Mercy. Long Island at post for two questions. Como le va? Bien, como está usted? Well, I, I want didn't want everybody, to. Everybody should know that Ambassador Oscar de Rojas, who is talking to us, from uh, Long Island University Post is a former very senior uh, diplomat, uh, first in the, embassy, in the mission of Venezuela and then in the United Nations itself. He is the person in charge of, has been in charge of financing for development uh, and obviously very unsuccessful because that is why we do not have enough financing for development in the UN. <laughs> Oh, oh, Ambassador, you, thank you. <laughs> Before we give the floor to our students, I just wanted to say hello to you and to say that this is really such a historic day because it's the first time that, thank to you and uh, the, um, the things that we were able to put together the last few months, 
LIU is now part of this, um, of this network, and uh, I'm very thrilled that this is really happening, so I couldn't possibly have missed this first one today. <laughs> I wanted to very quickly introduce to you to my right is Professor Amy Friedman. She's the chairperson of the Political Science and International Studies Department at LIU Post. I'm sure you will see her many times. Uh, Thank you for having us. And uh, again, we feel so happy uh, that we can do this. So my greetings to you, my old friend, and also to Mr. Sniffen. And uh, I will now please uh, revert to, to our students and to Professor Friedman. Sure. Thank you both, um, Ambassador Kamal and Mr. Sniffen, for your comments. Um, our students have two questions. Uh, my name is Mark Satir. I'm an undergraduate student in political science. And I'm curious as to what methods the UN can do to support developing nations and to create sustainable energy sources, is it just going to cause an inject of cash, or is there other methods they can use? Second question. I'm an undergraduate student here at Post. Uh, my question is, how can focusing on sustainability and lowering emissions in developing nations also help improve their economic status? Great questions. Uh, Mr. Sniffen, sir, yes. on sustainable energy, to begin with, I don't like adjectives, as you know. Yes. Uh, nouns, About renewable nouns stand on their own merit, mm -hmm. and so adjectives are not necessary. We have an energy shortage in the world, Certainly. and as populations increase and as development increases, there will be increased requirements of energy, and the gap the, the fact that fossil fuels are on the decline because they will die at some stage. And when that happens, that gap will have to be met somehow. And, and, I, and I know you have the answer. I know. I, <laughs> you know that I have the answer because these sexy things which you talk about, which is solar energy and wind energy and tidal energy, is not going to make the gap disappear. There is only one way of meeting that gap only one, and that is nuclear energy. And so face up to the fact that we are going to turn towards nuclear energy. And you have a problem because nuclear energy is dual purpose. And that's your problem. And that's why I have said from day one, let's have complete nuclear disarmament and then go ahead with nuclear energy. But you are not willing to give up your nuclear weapons. And if you are not willing to give up your nuclear weapons, I will not give up mine. So, I'm sorry, uh, uh, nuclear, without nuclear disarmament, nuclear energy becomes a non-starter. And without nuclear energy, we cannot meet uh, the energy requirements of a future world 50 years from today. You want to disagree? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I have to remind myself every once in a while that I that I'm not the White House spokesman or the uh, the Kremlin spokesman. When sometimes, but uh, uh, anyway, the, the uh, greetings to Ambassador uh, De Rojas. Uh, as he probably has told you, there is a financing for development meeting going on here uh, yesterday and today, a uh, high level meeting, which also is discussing uh, even this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken the links between that process and the sustainable development financing process and trying to marry the two in time for 2015 in some fashion. But, and, and one of the energy, one of the areas that there is a significant amount of financing, both public and private, is in the energy sector. Uh, and one of the roles that the UN plays is to get countries or help countries be investment friendly uh, whether it's, part of, whether it's part of the climate change process where they have access to funds under the clean development mechanism or whether it's directly from energy sources. Um, the, the, there is a, a UN initiative that the Secretary General embarked upon called the Sustainable Energy for All Initiative and that is a three-pronged attack at, at energy. One, to expand access by 30% by 2030. One, to make energy sources, existing energy sources, more efficient by 30% by 2030, and also to bring renewable sources as a 30% mix in the energy supply. Um, UNEP is, is not 
deals with energy and its impact side primarily, but also on the finance side, where we try to encourage through pilot projects and small scale initiatives, the uh, expansion of renewable energy, uh, particularly in the developing world. Because in most places, they're not about to expand the grid. They're going to have to do things either locally through investments in renewables, whether it be whether it be geothermal in some cases or solar, depending on what is applicable to the country's concern. And that's one of the things we do with the U.S. Uh, Natural Resource Energy Laboratory is to help countries identify what renewable energy sources are uh, relevant to their domestic and geographic circumstances. Um, the second question was I can sustainable. Do it. Yeah. Well, I, our belief is that by investing in a healthy uh, environment, we, you underpin and give long-term uh, viability to your economy by investing in, in natural resources that underpin your economy, particularly if you are uh, in an economy that deals with primary uh, products, extractive, forests, fisheries, and so forth, that they need to be sustainable in order for you to maintain them as you de eventually diversify your economy. So the sustainability is a factor into the long-term growth of a national economy. But other parts of the UN system do it on a much larger scale because they have greater access to financing and credit and grants and loans. But you do recognize that the, the we, meaning the United Nations system, which includes the World Bank and everything else bilateral, that we have been highly unsuccessful in the past 50 years, 60 years, because poverty is increasing everywhere. And the taste of the pudding is in the eating. And so I don't care about your ideas. I want the pudding on the table and the pudding is not available. And so, <laughs> sorry, the, the whole business of economic development requires, as I said, a macro effort. And that macro effort is not forthcoming. And you are trying to divert us in this conspiracy of yours towards the environment, which is very, very wrong and immoral on your part. Oh. Over, to Mer <laughs> Over to Mercy for two points. For mercy. I need Mercy. From, from, yes. <laughs> from Mercy followed by Skidmore. Mercy, you have the floor. Hi. Um, my name is Kathleen Paranello, and I'm an undergraduate student from uh, Mercy College in the Manhattan campus. Uh, my question was that I'm assuming that you are aware that is that there's less than 1% of fresh water on the planet. Um, what are we doing to keep this water fresh with pollution and waste thrown into our oceans daily and oil spills? Are we spreading the awareness that our drinking water is limited and scarce? Very good. Second question. Hello, my name is Abigail. Thank you very much for speaking and for the valuable information. Can you speak um, louder, please? This question is directed more to Ambassador Kamal. Um, Mr. Smithin mentioned that um, the UN works with governments and uh, who set priorities, generate funds, and control resources. Um, do you feel that as a, as a learning community who's interested in eco-friendly development, do you feel that we can make a change despite the priorities of our government? And if so, where do we begin? Uh, no, you take the water question because we haven't dealt with water yet and it's an important question. Uh, well, I think I mentioned at the beginning that one of the areas that climate change will impact the greatest is, is water, fresh water in particular. Both the supply uh, and the um, acidification uh, or the salinization of it through encroachment of sea level rise. Um, as you mentioned, the hydrological cycle is fixed. Water supply is fixed. The problem that has been occurring is we, one, population growth is one, uh, but more appropriately, the areas where the population is shifting. More and more people live in coastal zones uh, where 
Uh, fresh water supply is at best uh, precarious in most cases or most vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, I don't know, there's some, one figure is that 60% of the world's population lives within 100 miles of a coast, uh, whether it's ocean or sea. Um, so there is that which is affecting a water, uh, prov the provision of water, uh, the, the quantity of water supply. Quality is being uh, damaged, as you mentioned, by uh, uncontrolled uh, pollution in some cases, so that which can be um, directly addressed through better uh, practices, industrial practices. But one area where we need to address urgently is the wastage, whether it's through the what we call the water footprint of the Western consumer, with uh, the expansion of golf courses around the on the planet or in the dry areas like Arizona and Nevada. Uh, to the the whole um, issue of oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, anyway, the there is the footprint issue, but it, there is there is also the being able to provide uh, more efficient water resources. Irrigation wastes somewhere in the neighborhood of forty percent of the water supply that it uses, and irrigation. Agriculture is 70% of the water usage around the world, no matter what the economy is, your national economy. So dealing with waste uh, of the water supply will help offset any uh, impact of population growth or the salinization. But it will take investment, uh, which hasn't been forthcoming just yet, but where the donor community or the, even the national governments have to redirect uh, financial resources. On the second question of uh, economic development priorities, I am the wrong person. The person to ask this question is really Ambassador Oscar de Rojas <laughs> in, uh, in uh, Long Island University. What I can tell you is that he was in charge of finding money for financing for development and he left the United Nations heartbroken <laughs> to join a university, Long Island University. You know, he's just not getting the money. Uh, over to skin more for two questions followed by uh, Feli Dickinson at Vancouver and Paul we may have to go for a few minutes over time over to uh, skin more hi my name is Kelsey Hall and I am a student at Skidmore College so we know Kyoto Protocol has been extended until a new treaty is agreed upon what will be the priorities for the upcoming conference of parties meeting in Warsaw next month Okay, good question. Second question. Hi, I'm Pat Babbitt, and my question is directed mainly to Ambassador Kamal. Um, what do you think of sustainable development as a pragmatic, decentralized, market-based approach, given the realities of the established global system supported by entrenched interests in political, economic, and cultural terms? Okay, Kyoto, sir. Uh, Warsaw will be another milestone or way station on the on the road to something to succeed Kyoto. It will try to clarify some of the mechanisms underneath it. Um, there are multiple processes happening simultaneously, multiple negotiations on different aspects of what will hopefully emerge in 2015 as as the French would hope as a Paris protocol, but that remains to be seen. It's whether you whether you can come up with or whether they can come up with something that is universal in scope geographically, but with differentiated responsibilities or obligations. And that's the tricky part, of course, is to get everybody on board with some sort of obligation that they are comfortable with that will help them address the target of uh, controlling emissions at two degrees centigrade 2020. But it's, you have Warsaw, and then you have Peru next year, and then you have 2015 in Paris, where they hope to have something ready for signature. On the second question, which is slightly outside the topic of climate change today, we have a major problem in the world. And the major problem is that one can no longer discuss an alternative 
to market based capitalism market based capitalism is now a fundamental which you cannot argue against but it has not worked because it has created enormous inequalities enormous gaps and enormous injustices in the world the problem is that the alternative which was a socialist economy was so heavily mishandled by the soviet union and by marxism leninism that nobody is now willing to talk about socialism at all but we will have to find an alternative to market based capitalism because i can assure you that uh, the frustration in the world is increasing with it astronomically every year over to vancouver for two questions followed by tina Good morning. My name is uh, my name is Felipe. I'm an undergrad here in FDU Vancouver, and my question is: One of the Millennium Development Goals involve environmental sustainability. Do you think we will reach the goal by 2015? And if not, what actions will the UN overtake? Second question. Hey, my name is Javier. I'm an undergraduate student here in FDU. And my question is, what are the actions that governments can take to reduce the mass media supporting consum consumption and no sustainability? Bravo for the second question. Bravo. <laughs> And, uh, I am a great admirer of Vancouver. First of all, you are always there in full force. And secondly, you ask intelligent questions. So, but you, Mr. Stephen, sir, yes, sir, Millennium Development Goals, eight targets. The answer to each one of the eight is no, 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 no. no, no. Relax and go to sleep because you're not going to achieve any of the targets of the Millennium Development Goals by the year 2015. and now you are trying to pull wool on everybody's eyes with a new set of targets called sustainable development goals which you will not achieve either and so uh, uh, please stop making monkeys out of all of us well and the the seventh goal environmental sustainability is in many ways unmeasurable so how do you quantify uh mainstreaming environment uh into development policy it's uh the the powers that be uh came up with what they call proxies and that was to you look at the climate change look at the treaty processes and see how well they're doing starting off early on with numbers of ratifications as if that was one way of doing it uh and then starting to look at carbon emission targets and uh ozone uh depletion chemical targets um which conveniently is quite successful so they had so they could point to that as uh, as a success story but under mdg7 you have other goals and what water, water supply is one uh which de depending on how you define access to water supply has been met but people would de debate that uh, certainly we would debate that because it's certainly the quality of water supply is is subject to interpretation the the other half of the water uh, goal deals with sanitation and and that is nowhere near being met and won't be met by 2015 by 2015 and hopefully by 2030 we meet it uh and then the slum target was easily met because it was uh something that could be done in two years so those targets have been met in in part but overall certainly lacking um Take the second question. The media question. We do work uh in a fashion with um the advertising community about messaging. We've been much more successful in Europe than we have been in North America to say the least. Uh one of the outcomes of the second Rio conference was the uh in, the inauguration of a process or a series of programs on sustainable consumption and production and there is one of the five programs which is on lifestyles and a great deal of that is on messaging but whether it's just beginning uh this year uh where we're working with uh, UNESCO primarily targeting a young audience like yourselves about the impact of consumer choices 
but it's the impact will be seen down the road and uh, we're not exactly hopeful. <laughs> yes, but you have to acknowledge that the purpose of the media is not to sell the message of, of environment. The purpose of the media is to sell overconsumption. They are just advertising so that they want you to buy more and overconsume more. And so the whole purpose of the media is to hook people so that they can sell products to you, not so that they can sell a message to you. So I'm sorry. Uh, that was not an honest answer from you on your part. Uh, over to Tinek for two questions from Tinek. A partial answer. Tinek for two uh, questions. What's a good restaurant? Shalom. Um, my name is Moses Hingyapuko. I'm a graduate here at FDU. And my question is more directly to uh, Mr. Stiffin. You had made two remarks earlier concerning the deforestation in Africa. One, you stated that it is apparently one of the um, largest deforestations, and that two, that there is arms sales based off of the, um, that is accounted for in, in the finances. My question then becomes, how do you suppose um, they justify sustaining a business that indirectly supports or finances arms sales? Okay, second question. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse. I'm a graduate student here at FDU. My question is also about deforestation. Can you talk a little bit about Ecuador and the um, Yasuni initiative to keep oil drilling out of the Yasuni rainforest? Um, as I know, a couple months ago, the initiative was scrapped after the international community could not raise enough money for the Ecuador government. How well did the UN and international community handle the situation? What we could have done better and what can we do now? Thank you. Uh, let me take the first question. Uh, the first question was about arms sales. Yeah. <clears throat> arms sales are a major industry in the it's a trillion dollars a year industry. And so there's a lot of money in it. And uh, take the United States. The United States has 535 members of Congress. Not one of them who does not have a major military industrial complex in his constituency from which it gets, he gets funding. And so political decisions are taken on the basis of arms sales benefits. And I'm sorry, there is nothing that can be done about it. Would you like to take Ecuador and drilling? Sure. Um, as the student mentioned, um, Ecuador embarked upon a very innovative uh, project called the Yasuni, which is an area in one of the national parks, uh, which is quite biologically diverse in Ecuador, where they would get credit for keeping the oil in the ground uh, that they knew was there or the oil companies knew were, were, were there. And they did it through a trust fund, which the UN handled, not my organization, but the UN Development Program handled, where they would solicit funds uh, from the donors as a, as a way of offsetting the revenue that Ecuador would have earned by drilling. Um, as, as mentioned, the, the president, uh, Correa, uh, announced a few months ago that because the funds that were in the trust fund were nowhere near the resources needed to offset the drilling uh, or the revenue they could generate, they would uh, cease the operation. Uh, right now, it's sort of in limbo as some donors are, are thinking of uh, salvaging it in some fashion but haven't really... Uh, written a check so but it was a an i an idea that on paper sounded quite good uh and it really put the pressure on the donor community to put to walk the talk uh, so to speak in funding it and uh except for germany i'm not aware of too many other governments which uh, backed the project financially over to madison for two questions from from Deb. <laughs> 
My name is Savannah Bennett and I'm an undergraduate student. My question is, what is the UN doing to reduce methane emissions? Whoa, we're gone. Uh, second, uh, second question, question is actually, uh, second question coming from me, from Mr. Sniffen. Uh, as a biologist, I am one of the 97% that believe that uh, the evidence is irrefutable given the thousands and thousands of research articles uh, in support of climate change. My question is, what is the benefit to denying uh, the science? Is it uh, individual-based organizations are spending quite a bit of resources in denying the science? And I'm just curious as to, is it a government that benefits to this? Are it individuals? We, in terms of overconsumption? Well, with regard to methane, I, I think there's two, two ways that the UN is trying to respond to it. Um, one is the agricultural sector, and the Food and Agriculture Organization is well aware of the volume of emissions from methane from uh, the agro-industry, and is looking at uh, changing in practice in some of which a uh, country like uh, New Zealand has championed uh, with the sheep industry uh, and trying to get them to, or uh, trying to spread certain practices throughout the industry. That, that's one. The other is uh, the methane that's generated by the melting of the permafrost in the Arctic. Um, and the Arctic region is, is not necessarily uh, part of the UN agenda by the uh, decision of the eight countries that that border on it and who are members of the Arctic Council. Uh, in fact, my organization is the only organization which, is, which is, has an observer status there and we only are there because we handle some of the environmental and biological data through one of our offices in Norway uh, or one of our partner agencies uh, based in Arendal. Uh, so there is, while we are raising awareness of the impact of methane on the equation, uh, as a short-lived uh, climate uh, pollutant, we realize that the, the responses have to come from uh, other parts. But we, our role is to raise awareness of the impact side of things and help where, need, where we can about the solution side. On the denial issue, uh, I think there's, it's, very, it's not a monolithic uh, group, to say the least. Uh, there are scientists who believe in climate change but believe that the, the diversion of financial resources to solve it could be better spent in other areas. Uh, AIDS, uh, health issues, whatever. Economic development, purely, however you want to look at it. But they do believe in climate change, and they do believe man is, is, is part of the equation, or the footprint. There are others who I would liken it to the tobacco industry uh, discussion in the United States, where they just funded denial, funded media outlets, to, to cast uh, aspersions or to sow doubt without scientific backing behind them. And you see that a lot, particularly in the United States, with the so-called so balanced media coverage where you have one scientist on one side and somebody on the other side being so that the media outlet could show that they have balanced coverage. But unfortunately, as you mentioned, you have 99% on this side and 1% over here, of which 1% is a very few scientists and more likely come from uh, political organizations uh, who have an agenda. Not some from the finance by the oil industry or energy industry sector, but not exclusively, certainly. So there is, it's a mixed group, but whether they are backed by a government that I certainly not in the in the U.S. context. I wouldn't say that, uh, and and very few other governments uh, do it uh, or have an, have would gain an advantage from that. Uh, more most governments believe in climate human induced climate change uh, as as a reality. The solution obviously is very simple. Versus earlier, no. if you get rid of all human beings in the world, that will get rid of the carbon dioxide emissions. And if you get rid of the cows in the world, that will get rid of the uh, methane emissions. And so get rid of human beings and cows and then we'll be in a happy world in which Mr. Sniffen will be the king of paradise. I leave it to you to close this session from your end. As tree huggers. <laughs> a lively and engaging discussion on climate change and future directions.
Uh, thank you all, uh, and stay green. May I, on your behalf, thank all the universities for participating, but most of all, Mr. Sniffen, for taking me in such good spirit. He knows that I'm an Irishman, uh, which means I love a good fight. And uh, so it's been a most enjoyable session for me. Thank you, sir. Anytime. Goodbye from the Ambassadors Club.